Tisha Bader in for Mark Golub, and in the news, Israel's ongoing and expanding efforts to help wounded Syrian civilians. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told foreign journalists earlier this week that he is asking Israel's foreign ministry to seek ways to expand medical assistance, especially in Aleppo. He said that while Israel can't stop the crisis, quote, we can help mitigate some of the suffering that's the best that Israel can do. And joining us now on the phone is IDF spokeswoman Captain Libby Weiss calling from Israel. Thank you so much, Libby, for joining us on JBS. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So as the prime minister pointed out in his remarks this week about Syria, Israel has treated thousands of Syrians in its hospitals to date. Can you give us a picture of how things actually work? How does Israel reach these wounded civilians? What are some of the logistics that go into what I can imagine is a very complex and complicated process? Sure. Well, actually, since 2013, uh, we have actually treated more than 2,600 uh, wounded Syrians who have come over from the border uh, along the uh, Syrian-Israeli border. Uh, and I, I can't go into the exact details of how, of how it happened. Uh, but these wounded individuals uh, who are coming from really horrific uh, instances within Syria uh, reach the border. Uh, there they are triaged by IDF paramedics who really provide them with initial medical care. Uh, and if their medical condition necessitates more care, then they then go and seek additional care in Israeli hospitals in northern Israel. And it's something that we've been doing for several years. Uh, we're very proud of the work that we're doing. Now, is there any sort of special training or preparation that these IDF soldiers who are basically the first faces that uh, these people see coming across the border, is there any special training or, or, you know, direction that they're given as far as not just the physical aspect of the treatment, but the emotional, the psychological? Of course. Uh, certainly they're well-experienced, uh, well-trained, professional uh, medical requirements of such a taxing Job. But more than anything, we also try to highlight for them, and it's something that they experience uh, as they're involved in these, uh, in these treatments, to understand the sensitivity that's involved, to understand the trauma that these people have experienced, uh, and how, how therapeutic it is to have a helping hand or a comforting hand that's there to assist them. So it's quite an experience, both uh, for the soldiers involved, um, and of course, the, the humanity of it is, is very important. Can you share some of those stories that you hear? I'm sure that you hear from these people who, when they get to Israel, as you said, it, they're escaping an intense war zone and really a, a horrific situation. What are some of the things you, you hear about those personal stories and experiences? Well, we've heard several incredibly moving stories, uh, so much about the human connection that they feel with the IDF paramedics that come and give them the initial treatment, uh, children that are coming across, uh, young adolescents that come across, people who for their whole lives uh, were raised to believe that Israel uh, was a horrible country, that Israel is their enemy, uh, and then the first, really the first people that they meet are in uniform, are IDF soldiers who give them the best medical treatment possible um, and who really extend this basic human, uh, human emotion to them. Uh, and, and all of the soldiers that I've spoken to are, who are directly involved really talk about what a moving experience it is to connect to them on, on such a basic level. And it's interesting to me, you just said um, that many of these Syrian civilians are educated to, to believe that Israel is the enemy. And I never really thought about that side of it before, that they're seeing people wearing these uniforms that represented something that was frightening or scary or, you know, uh, hateful to them, and yet these are the people greeting them and extending a hand and extending many times life-saving treatment, and perhaps what, who knows what the ripple effects of just that encounter could be. Certainly, uh, and again, for us, it's so important for the paramedics that are really on the, literally on the border, on the front line, uh, for them to be aware of that, and they're fully aware of that in every, in every act that they carry out along the border to understand uh, what a human connection they're, they're creating with, uh, with the Syrians that are coming over. Uh, and generally speaking, we see it as a moral imperative to, to help them and to help in any way that we can, and it's something that we've been doing for several years. Uh, and we're really invested and, and proud of the work that we're doing. 
Now, Libby, talk a minute about the difference between, I know there are field hospitals that are set up perhaps very close to Israel's border with Syria, and then, of course, there are those wounded that you mentioned, perhaps with more serious injuries or um, illnesses that are then transferred to Israeli hospitals. What, how does that sort of break down? Sure. So we have, as a military and as a country, we have vast experience in field medicine. Uh, as I'm sure it's known, uh, known to some of your viewers, we have gone all over the world after natural disasters and established field hospitals. So it's something that we have a lot of experience doing. Uh, the, the wounded Syrians that come over are, are triaged initially by paramedics, uh, are given initial medical care, and then at that stage it's seen that they need more extensive medical care that can be provided by by paramedics on the border, then they go to established hospitals, civilian hospitals in, uh, in northern Israel. Uh, it's a joint effort to give them the initial medical care that they need on the spot to triage their situation, to see what they need, and then to move them to a more long-term uh, facility to, to help them in whatever, whatever they may need. Now, the World Health Organization actually recently um, awarded Israel a really an incredible honor that is so well deserved. Um, just last month, they awarded Israel's emergency medical team and field hospital the highest ranking in the world, the number one international emergency team. That is an incredible accomplishment. Yes, it's something that we've invested uh, years in. We are the only country, only country to receive such a designation from the United Nations. Uh, something that we are very, very, very proud of. And I can say from my personal experience, I, I really have the distinct privilege of being both in the delegations that the IDF and the State of Israel sent to the Philippines, as well as more recently in Nepal. Uh, and it's absolutely wonderful to see the work that's done, to see really the human work that's done to helping uh, and helping other people in whatever situation they may be in. But we have a lot of experience doing it, and we are proud to do it in any place and in any location. Now, let me ask you, when you've gone to uh, places like Nepal, what, how, what is the initial reaction of the people that you encounter there that maybe have never met an Israeli before, or have never perhaps met someone who was Jewish before? What, what are some of the responses that you find? Uh, we have just been overwhelmed by the appreciation that we feel. Uh, and many of these, uh, these labels or these differences that we might feel in the, in the everyday uh, certainly in situations like this are themselves. People are overwhelmed with gratitude, and it's such a pleasure to, to help them and to see the impact that we're able to give them and the appreciation that they feel. Uh, and a few things are better than being able to create such a human contact, human relationship with somebody else. Um, it's something that we do, and it, it's, it's a miracle every time. Now, back to Syria for a moment. Israel, of course, borders Syria with the Golan Heights, and there has been... Um, there have been several instances of spillover from the civil war into Israeli territory. How does the IDF respond to those situations? Well, we're monitoring the border very closely. Uh, we've always monitored the border, uh, certainly in the last several years, as uh, the civil war has uh, taken place and has ramped up. Uh, we're, we're monitoring the situation uh, even more closely. Uh, we do everything possible to make sure that civilians that are living in northern Israel can go on with their daily lives. Uh, the daily life isn't impacted. We're monitoring the situation uh, and making sure that uh, whatever is happening within Syria won't spill over or won't impact uh, life within Israel. But we are, we are on guard 24-7. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu did mention that he was seeking ways that Israel could expand uh, what it already is doing in Syria. Can you share with us any of those ideas or ways in which Israel is looking to, you know, get perhaps even a farther reach? He mentioned Aleppo specifically, that Israel would do its best to get women and children wounded and, and men as well if they were not combatants. Can you speak on that? Uh, well, certainly the, the Prime Minister outlined several ideas. Uh, we, of course, will be ready to do whatever it is uh, that we need to do based on uh, the government's decision uh, on how to react kind of situation. Uh, but as of now, we're really focusing our efforts and our energies on what we've been doing, which is continuing to give medical care, uh, the best medical care we can to as many people as possible. Uh, and of course, we are waiting to understand what else uh, we may be called to do, and we will certainly be ready to do that, uh, whatever it is. 
And what would you say is the main motivating factor for Israel to take on this position, really, which I'm sure there is great risk involved. There's certainly a great financial um, impact on these, the service, the, the, treat, the medical treatment that um, is provided to these Syrian civilians. What is it that really um, motivates Israel in providing this life-saving help and um, and what is the impact in the international community? Well, for us, um, the motivation is very clear. Uh, we see it as a moral imperative to help. Uh, a, a critical element of the IDF uh, code of conduct uh, is, is valuing human life. Uh, and we see no better way to be able to really apply that principle uh, than in this case. Uh, there are people that are, are wounded, people that are experiencing horrific, horrific things. We have the ability to help. Uh, and for us, it's, it's a very clear moral imperative to do so. Uh, and that's exactly why we've been doing it for, for several years now. And do you, see, do you see the effect on the international community? I mean, Israel deals with so much. We, we have bias at the United Nations. You have, you know, BDS on the rise and a lot of things sort of on the negative column. But you have this incredible positive uh, role that really would be hard to argue in any situation. Do you find that sort of positivity coming back um, as a result of Israel's role in this capacity? Uh, I, well, certainly as a nation, we've seen a lot of responses uh, to what the Prime Minister said. Uh, but for us, it, it comes less from a place of, of wanting to receive uh, congratulations uh, from, other, from other countries. For us, we do this because it's the right thing to do, uh, very simply put. And we'll continue to do it as long uh, as, long as our mandate extends. Uh, and, and for us, any, any additional benefit is wonderful, of course, uh, but the real benefit here is, is being able to help other human beings. Now, Libby, let's leave Syria for a moment. I just want to ask you um, a couple of things about the IDF itself. And in particular, um, there's been some discussion lately about the roles that women play in the IDF. Women, of course, serve for two years um, in the Israeli army and more women joining combat units, having combat roles. There is some discussion about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, what the difficulties are, perhaps challenges. Can you speak to that for a moment? Sure. Well, women have always played a, a critical role within uh, the defense of the state of Israel uh, for decades already. Uh, and now in a very exciting trend, we're seeing more and more women interested young women interested when they draft to serve in infantry combat units. Uh, something that we are aware of, we see, we see their demand and their motivation to do so. Uh, and we're opening several uh, co-ed infantry battalions to really allow women to have that place to serve side by side with men as combat soldiers. But we see it as a very, very positive thing. Uh, we as women have a lot to contribute and uh, many skills that we can contribute uh, into the military and to defending the state of Israel and skills that have nothing to do with our gender. And it's, it's wonderful to see women who are more and more excited about taking on those kinds of roles. Absolutely. And then there is also um, a, a rise in the ultra-Orthodox who are serving in the IDF. There are some units I know that are specifically um, made up of religious soldiers. And then there are those units that are integrated. How, do you, how does that kind of break down and how do you see that? Well, as a draft military, uh, we want to be a military in which all citizens of Israel can serve and can serve comfortably. Uh, and, of course, equality is a cornerstone uh, of the military, and making sure that everybody can serve comfortably and can serve in a respectful and meaningful way. Uh, so, as you mentioned, there are units of ultra-Orthodox soldiers uh, that, are, that are male only, and, of course, units, and most units within the military that incorporate women. Uh, and our goal is to try and allow for everyone to serve as comfortably uh, and respectfully as possible. Thank you so much, Libby, uh, for your time and for the service that you provide. And we hope to speak with you very soon again here on JBS and uh, continue the imperative and important work that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Captain Libby Weiss is the IDF spokeswoman, and we thank her very much for joining us here on JBS and giving us some perspective into Israel's ongoing and expanding efforts to help save lives of Syrian civilians that come across the border and are treated at field hospitals and in Israeli 
hospitals. As always, thank you so much to our director, Sloan Copeland, production coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, and editors, Dennis Golan and John McDevitt. I'm Tisha Bader, in for Mark Golub on this edition of In the News.